A while back, Shannon had a discussion with ecological landscaper and educator, Larry Weiner. During their discussion, he gave what I think is probably one of the best descriptions of what ecological landscaping is. Let's check out what he had to say. I just realized as we're talking, we might want to kind of define a little bit about what we're talking about when we're talking ecology-based landscaping, because I think most of our listeners are going to be familiar with that concept, even if they haven't really heard the terms, but there might be a few that have it. So would you like to take a stab at explaining what we're talking about here? One thing that I think it is, or a few of the components, clearly native plants are part of it. But I do want to make clear, and there's different folks have different uh, opinions on this, but while I am a big advocate and am practicing in my own practice, left to my own devices, I'll probably have an all native landscape. However, I don't have a problem with non-native plants being used in the landscape. Now, if they are invasive and an invasive plant is defined as one that escapes cultivation and through its aggressive nature significantly alters the ecology of wild places that it spontaneously occurs in. That's called an invasive plant and they're ecologically damaging to our natural areas. So those I would not use and I don't think and anybody should. However, um, the vast majority of non-native plants don't act like that, and there is no reason why they should be shunned from the landscape. But what I will say, though, is that those plants do not have the same ecological connections, meaning our native insects are not as well adapted to utilize them, birds, other animals are not, they have not co-evolved with the plants that are not native. Consequently, uh, I think that uh, no need to exclude non-native plants, but I think if you want to do something beneficial environmentally, there should be a significant number of native plants included in the landscape. There's nothing wrong with a rose garden over here. There's nothing wrong with peonies over here. As long as you've got some little blue stem and some dogwood trees and some oak trees that do have a uh, highly effective support of our native wildlife. But a lot of uh, discussion is occurring now about the use of native plants and for the reasons I just mentioned and other reasons that they're desirable to use. And there are a lot of claims uh, that maybe oversell native plants in a way or oversimplify what you're going to get from using them. There's a reason to use them. They have um, tremendous ecological benefits. When used intelligently, they can reduce the maintenance which is required for landscapes. However, I think that understanding not only which plants to use where and try to accent a high percentage of native plants, that the processes that govern the success and failure of those plants in the wild need to be understood and also brought into landscape design. One of the ideas here is from a maintenance standpoint, everybody wants to reduce maintenance. I've had a lot of clients in 40 years. Not one has ever said to me, I want to, I want a high maintenance landscape. I want to be working constantly out there. I want to pay lots of money for contract. Nobody ever wants that. So the lowest possible maintenance that can occur given what an individual client or property owner wants is what ought to happen. And native plants are often billed as much lower maintenance. I think when used intelligently, that can absolutely be true. But just because you threw a native plant into your landscape doesn't automatically mean it's low maintenance. For one thing, a plant that is growing or is planted in a environment that is similar to where it naturally occurs will be much more self-sufficient, likely to survive and thrive, that one is planted in a place that's completely different from where it naturally occurred. Now, you may live in the state of Tennessee or Kentucky, and you may see a list of plants that are native to Tennessee and Kentucky, but there isn't one environment in Tennessee and Kentucky. There's, there's woodlands, there's fields, there's wet areas, there's dry areas, there's shale, there's all kinds of things. So taking a native plant in, that is native to shale barrens in Kentucky and put it in a wet, have you achieved low maintenance? Have you achieved the plant that will be self-sufficient? No, you have not. So it's not just, oh, it's native, I can use it and everything will be perfect. One of the requirements here is to look a little deeper into where plants grow and kind of how they operate in nature and bring that into garden design. 
that's what I would call ecology-based landscaping. It's using native plants and using them in a fashion where you are incorporating or considering an understanding of where and how they grow in nature and adapting that to garden design because you're not just planting a wild place in your backyard. You're also planting, you, you want wildlife, you want plants that are self-sufficient to lower maintenance. You also wanna like the landscape and enjoy being in it. So when I say bringing it in and adapting it, I mean, understanding what goes on out there, but making some alterations so that this is a place for you to enjoy. It's not just for wildlife, but it looks like a, a imposing mess to you. It's gotta be speaking to the environment, as well as you as the as in the person that's living there. Yes. I mean, that is so important because I'm right there with you on that. I mean, you've got to find that balance between what we want in our own landscapes and what works for us and our families, as well as what works for the plants or for the animals and the pollinators and the insects and the everything else that we want to attract. And yeah, I, I love my native plants, but, and I'm almost all natives, but yeah, there's some non-natives too that are really nice and that I like, and they serve one purpose or another, even if it's just to bring a smile to my face in the middle of February and Mar early March yeah. when the daffodils are blooming. Yeah, and I would say that there is an aesthetic component to environmental design, meaning in landscapes that are uh, contributing positively to the overall environment that they are in and that, is, that's, that surrounds them. One could say, well, I can create this environment of native plants and it is absolutely optimal for wildlife and water requirements are way less. It's environmentally great. But if it happens to look like a mess to many people, what are the environmental benefits of that landscape? Well, the environmental benefits exist in and amongst those plants, but how many people are going to replicate that if they don't like what it looks like? Mm -hmm. So the idea of making an environmentally contributing and functioning landscape that also is appealing to people, which is absolutely possible, has environment. You say, well, the appealing part doesn't matter ecologically. I would argue that it does, because if nobody likes it, Whatever you plant is going to be there, but nobody else is going to do it. If folks are walking by your neighborhood and saying, boy, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. They're going to start popping up. And I see examples of this. They're going to start popping up all over the place. And whatever ecological accomplishments you have done on your property are now multiplied by all the other folks that you influence. So I think that making these things really attractive uh, is not just about making people happy, which it is, and that's important, but it also has an environmental, an uh, indirect, but very real environmental uh, benefit. Yes. And that's something that I'm learning and starting to apply more in my own gardens and stuff, because I kind of like the wild and crazy look, but I live out in the middle of the country. That's more acceptable there to some extent. Not always. Um, but when you get into town, you can't do that because you've got the community standards and the neighborhood standards and everything that you have to work around. And I'd almost, I'm getting to the point where I almost say that wild and crazy look in the wrong places can actually be detrimental, even if it's all native plants, because it turns people away instead of saying, like you're saying, making it beautiful so that people want to replicate it and do it. And so then you expand more the benefits off of your own little property. An example of that idea, uh, there was, a, I've been running a, uh, our firm has been running a landscape uh, symposium since 1990, and we have landscape architects and designers speaking, it's largely for a professional audience. And one of the speakers uh, was a well-known landscape architect, and he was talking about his home landscape, which was in a very small town, right in the middle of town on the main, on Main Street, basically. And he had an old colonial house with a porch, and there was a sidewalk. And between the sidewalk and his porch was like about a four foot wide bed that was open for planting. And he planted poplar trees in there, which uh, are cool trees, but they're aggressive and wild. And, you know, they send out roots and everything else uh, in, in a four foot wide bed. And the way he described it was that uh, the people in town didn't like it. They all hated it. And um, he intimated, he intimated, he said directly that the reason they hated it was because they didn't understand it. And I looked at it and I don't like it either. <laughs> I understand what you're doing, but it don't look good, you know? Um, so uh, I think we got to be realistic about what is it, you know, what, it, and, and there's great variations. What 
what this person thinks is beautiful and it's wild is their opinion and somebody else hates it. That's their opinion. No one can ever prove they're right or wrong there. So we have to understand that people's uh, folks uh, have their own aesthetic preferences. And as a landscape designer, I got to take that into consideration in every single project. You know, what is going to appeal to you? And you can, I've done native land, all native landscapes that are completely formal. Not what I do in general, but I have done that on occasion. And, you know, let's say high bush blueberry. If high bush blueberry is in like a wild thicket versus high bush blueberry in a hedgerow, formal, straight line hedgerow, I don't think the birds are bypassing the berries on that straight line hedgerow because the formality of it offends their sensibilities. They're going to come down and eat the berries, whether they're in a wild thicket or whether they're in a straight row. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways that ecology-based design can be expressed um, from a stylistic uh, standpoint. Larry is also the co-author of the excellent book, Garden Revolution, How Our Landscapes Can Be a Source of Ecological Change, which I will link in the description, along with the entire podcast that this clip came from. If you want to dive right in and learn some simple tips on how to create an awesome pollinator garden, then check out this video and be sure to get out and explore nature in your backyard.